my presentation with this little video that shows a whole bunch of my work from the past 10 years, just really fast, kind of getting into my head. sort of accidental career photography and different things that led me kind of to the show tonight and the ups and downs and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I'd first like to start with a quote by Edward Hopper, no amount of skillful invention can replace the essential element of imagination. And that's kind of what I feel is my biggest tool, is my imagination. And I get asked all the time, like, what camera do I use? But for a lot of the photos in that montage, I went to Sam's Club and got this digital camera with a two lens kit and just shot with it until I realized that I needed to upgrade. So for me, it's my imagination. And I can pinpoint it back to this one moment that I always like to reenact. So um, first, my background is, um, I got my degree in visual communications and that was a lot of you know, graphic design, darkroom photography, which I really loved that, but I felt like I could only make a career out of graphic design. So I went into that and I did that for 14 years, probably enjoyed a year of that 14 years. And I wanted to get back into photography, so I went and got a camera and I was in a dance group. And one night, um, I thought I looked pretty good, so <laughs> I, had my hair all done up and I went and I got in um, and my setup is not much better now. It's very simple. So I went into the bedroom and I sat on the edge of the bed and I pulled the window shade all the way up to get the most light that I could 
and I do have a remote now, but I didn't then, so I, I just held, you know, the camera back as far as I could, that I could, you know, press the shutter, and then I looked behind me, and it was kind of a big old mess, so I took a blackboard, and I, and I put it like this, and I took the picture, and I'll show you that picture in just a minute. <laughs> but when I look back, um, I think I've been doing that stuff all along. So I'm going to show you some of my earliest conceptual pictures tonight. And not many people see these. So <laughs> you guys are very lucky. <laughs> Hold on to your seats. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my first model, Smokey. And as you can see, I was trying something. <laughs> Secretary, I don't know. I'm trying to cover that ironing board up. But all along, I've been kind of into this whole thing with creating pictures or drawings. And I'm just, even though I had a little bit of a break, I'm continuing with that. Frida Kahlo said, I paint self-portraits because I'm so often alone, because I'm the person I know best. When I started out doing self-portraits, I didn't say this quite as eloquently. I would say, I take self-portraits because I always know what the photographer wants, I'm always there, and I don't complain that much. <laughs> so back to that day that I'm sitting on the edge of the bed, taking that, that photo just with my arms, clicking that shutter. This was the photo that happened. Now, I don't proclaim this is a fantastic photo by any means, but I just thought, you know what, if I made this with my arms, what, what else can I do? So this was around, um, I guess it's been 11 years ago when I got back into to shooting again. And the site Flickr was the main photo sharing site at that time. Um, now, it, it, people have their Instagram and it's all over the place but Flickr is where I was going to share stuff mostly with friends and family and then I started to look at other female self-portrait artists and, and get inspired and I was you know still a graphic designer at that point so I would run home I live five minutes from work put on some kind of vintage outfit take a photo that didn't really you know, make any sense, but I just, you know, had an idea and the passion for it, and then I would run back to work, uh, back to work after that. And a lot of times I would be late, and my friend would say, you, you were doing a, a portrait session or at home, weren't you? I was like, yeah, I was. <laughs> so I was just, I was just so excited about getting back into it, and anything would inspire me, whether it was a flower, um, a dress, or a mask, and I was just shooting all these self-portraits and putting them online and starting to gain a little bit of a following that way. And then here's a few more from that time period. And also during this time I was getting hired from, um, started about friends and friends of friends and doing family portraits and things like that. And then I was uh, contacted by a book cover <coughs> agency that wanted to use um, my photos for book covers and I thought well if I get a few of those that would be pretty fun and then within a couple of years I had a ton of them and then a, a couple in Australia saw the image on the bottom left and based on that image alone asked me to come speak at a conference there and <laughs> I, did, I didn't go that direction but um, <laughs> And then, I, and, I, and having some time to look back on that, I think about all these different things that happened and how just that one day sitting in my bedroom taking that picture led to this opportunity. And I'm gonna bring up Australia several times during this talk because there's a lot of things that happened and didn't happen on that trip. One thing people ask me about a lot is how do I find inspiration and there's just there's lots of ways. Um, it can be just something I find in an antique mall. With this particular work it's you know having become a mother and the mother-daughter relationship. But starting out I think one of the biggest inspirations for me was music. And at the time I was shooting a lot of kind of 
families in the park, photo shoots. But then I was doing this creative work on the side and I didn't really know or have the confidence to do sort of interesting work that was going to be paid for. So I decided to create a um, exercise, a creativity exercise just for myself. And what I did was I turned to these guys, mm -hmm. the Beatles, for inspiration. And what I would do is I would take a Beatles song and then I would create an image based on that song. And it could be really obvious when you looked at it or it could be a little more obscure. But the whole point was just to be creative and to keep working on something. And at the time I was just shooting, my creative work was just, you know, whatever I thought was interesting, I'd shoot it. And I, I kind of miss that now because everything has to be wrapped up in a nice little package and in a series but it, it was fun to just go well I want to do this today and then shoot that one so this series became kind of my first full series and it was all purely based on trying to stay creative and it's called my Beatles the first one I shot was this one and it's um, inspired by the song Norwegian Wood I took the lyrics she told me she worked in the morning and started to laugh. I told her I didn't and crawled up to sleep in the bath. And when I awoke, I was alone. This bird had flown. So I was just really getting into photography and also being a graphic designer using Photoshop and doing montages and, and, and just going for it. And I want to show you um, this work now.
So that was the first series I ever did, and it was purely just a creativity exercise, just to keep me creative. I think I was so afraid that photography would turn into what graphic design had turned into, which was, you know, started doing what everyone else wanted, and by the end, it wasn't mine anymore. So it was a great exercise also because it, I did get a show with it, and I learned how to frame it and prepare it and artist talk and all that stuff so it had this wonderful purpose and even though um, I'm not shooting like based on music for series anymore it's music is still always inspiring me um, this is a photo from this series the heart and the heavy one day I was in the car and I um, heard this song called a soft place to land and the lyrics went, I'm looking for a soft place to land, the forest floor, the palm of your hand, and I couldn't get it out of my head. And whenever an idea comes in my head, I used to sketch it, and now unfortunately I have a smartphone, so I just type it in there, and it's <laughs> not as artistic looking. But, um, and eventually, I think this took about six months to, you know, finally find the right mattress and the spot in the woods and to shoot that, but it all came to me from a song I heard on the radio. This is another one from this series, The Heart and the Heavy. There's a cardigan song called The Junk of the Heart, and I had heard it for years and didn't think anything of it. It didn't bring anything to me, and then one day I started thinking about that title, and then this image immediately came, it came to mind. This one I'm going to talk about another story with it later, but this is based on an R.E.M. song, World Leader Pretend. And there's a part of the song that says, reach out for me, hold me tight, hold that memory, let my machine talk to me, let my machine talk to me. And that was completely based on that part of the song. So um, music has always inspired me, and there's a few images in here that are not directly related to songs, but they, there's always some inspiration there. So back to this Australia trip. This is the first time I'd ever spoken in public and I was one of the, the main speakers and one of the only international speakers there. And it was a great experience. Um, my ego got a little built up. People were really excited and telling me how fantastic and famous I was gonna be. And they um, had a, a interview with a, a magazine set up for me and I had a 16 page spread in an international photography magazine and people were you know saying when this comes out that like galleries are going to be knocking your door down it's going to be you know crazy for you and I tried to have a level head but um I was kind of excited and then the magazine came out and can I get some guesses on how much how many responses I got from the magazine it was in Barnes and Nobles and everything <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Any numbers? No. None. <laughs> None. I think my mom and I were the only ones that bought one. <laughs> and I was pretty bummed about it. And my husband, who's there, said, well, what are you doing? Are you, are you shooting for you or are you shooting for other people? And for a few months, I kind of stepped back and started thinking about what was I doing and what was my goal? And all I could think about was this image of a woman in a field with a house tied to her back. My daughter was maybe almost two at the time. And even though I felt like this great love, it was also heavy on me. So I wanted to shoot this photograph of this woman who just, you know, holding her family tightly, yet it weighed, weighed heavy on her. And that was probably the first time I kind of looked internally to shoot um, a photograph like that. Um, everything else was sort of just ideas that I thought, for lack of a better term, were cool. You know? And that became the first image in the series, The Heart and the Heavy. And I started thinking about emotions I was going through and my friends and, and what it's like to be a woman and, and touch on those things, um, like aging and trying to have this eternal beauty and youth 
and also social media and how that has changed our relationships as well. I'm going to show you that series now. For that whole series was if nobody saw any of the images would I still be proud of it and that's kind of what I'm trying to carry through from here on out but you know when I started shooting this way people related to it more and I got a couple of gallery representations out of it and ended up having solo shows and, and all these things happen surrounding this work so, um, kind of, for, to be corny, shooting from the heart, sort of led me to things. Um, but you never know, like, what's going to lead where. So, you know, back to this picture again. <laughs> of all the people I met in Australia, which everybody was Australian, except one guy from Tennessee. And he um, wanted me to come and do a workshop. And I'd never done one before. And I didn't know what to do. Like how do you teach people to be creative? So I started to like kind of pick apart, you know, how do I, you know, be creative? And, and music, as I said before, was one of those things. So I decided I'm going to do a music exercise for the class. I'm going to play a song. They have to think about like the lyrics um, or it could lead them to something that leads them to something else. It didn't matter as long as that music was making you 
come up with this idea and we were all going to share the ideas. But I was going to shoot mine beforehand so I could share it with everyone. And that's why I shot this one based on the R.E.M. song. That was what I chose. So I entered this in a contest called Project Imagination. And basically they took five celebrities and they chose photos to um, use as inspiration for a short film. And lo and behold, Jamie Foxx chose this photo to be the inspiration of his short film. So my husband and I we went to New York City <laughs> and I photobombed unintentionally celebrities. <laughs> but uh, let's look at that one instead. That one looks better. And I don't ever do this, but I tweeted out to Jamie Foxx and said, I cannot wait to see you tomorrow night. And he tweeted back and said, I can't wait to see you either. I was like, this is going to be just life changing. So um, we get there and we watch the films and then everyone's mingling at the end and we can't find him. And then he looks like he's about to leave, and my husband goes, oh, he can't leave. Like, you are the base of his film. And he runs and taps him on the shoulder, and you, you swear that he said, come on. But we ended up on an elevator with him and his family. And you know how elevators are awkward with anyone? Well, it's no less awkward with Jamie Foxx when he's trying to leave and get out of there. And I just barely said, like, hey. I was the robot picture, and he shook my hand, and then I could kind of read the elevator and be like, you know, that's probably all that's going to happen. And they, we ended up getting ushered out. They were sneaking him out. Then we were locked out, and then we had to walk all the way back around. But that was okay. Because it wasn't my moment that I thought, because in addition to the five celebrity directors, they had a contest for up-and-coming directors to do the same thing and pick photos. And this young guy from California chose my photo. And he did a short film called Chucked. And if you go on YouTube and put in Chucked by Jared Nelson, I think it's still up there. And he recreated the robot exactly and did this love story between it and a girl, and it's a book drop. He made it a book drop in a library. These are some stills from it. <laughs> and then I met the guy, and he gave me the heart that lit up from the robot. And that, that photo was pretty personal to me anyway, because one of my good friends is the model, and shortly after that, she moved to Hawaii. So I don't see her very much anymore. So for that to be the photo, and then and the heart actually lights up and beats. And it was such a cool personal moment that totally overshadowed that Jamie Foxx thing. And so it was, you never know what's going to happen. And also would have never known that the guy I met in Australia would lead me to even shooting that photo. And you know, that all came from the book cover and all that other stuff. So I always like to bring these things up, like you think something's supposed to be one way and then you look back several years and something cool has happened from it that was unexpected. So look that up, it's like 10 minutes long, it's really cute. Um, this kind of leads to the work now. Um, I had shown the heart and the heavy in a gallery and I kind of shot and framed it up until it was time to show. So I had everything ready and this woman comes up to me at the exhibition and says, well, what are you working on next? And I wanted to just clutch on to something and go, is this not enough for you? Like, <laughs> this is, this is, oh, really? And I just like scrambled and I said, uh, you know what, I think I'll do these same kind of concepts but with girl, young girls, and see how they, those ideas would change if um, a young girl was in that situation and not a, a, an adult. And then I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I just thought about that. That's awesome. And, and so I had some friends' daughters lined up. But the first one I did was of my daughter. And it was, I took this photo um, from the Heart and the Heavy series, and that one I, I wanted to kind of um, speak about social media and how we always put like our best face forward and we never see the bad stuff. Everything's edited. And that's what 
the, the reason behind shooting that one was. And I took those same pieces and used it with my daughter, who had just turned four at the time. I, I wasn't sure she was going to cooperate, and she did. And I was immediately said, you know, that's we're just going to shoot her, and it's going to be about the mother-daughter relationship, and that's how this whole series here came to be. Kind of me scrounging for an answer, and then finding a, a, a new path for it. So we shot it for a couple of years, um, I'd say between ages four and six. Every now and then I'll have an idea and we'll do something else, but I would say for right now it's completed, though I know those topics can go on forever. Um, I'm going to pull up a few to talk about specifically. Um, this one is called Cycle. and. I was thinking about the Elizabethan collar as a symbol of you know, heritage and tradition. And what traditions do I want to keep with her? And what things do I want to you know, break and start anew for us? This one is shed. Um, most, of the, there's a, most of the dresses in this series were mine when I was a kid. And she's wearing one of mine here. And then those are portraits of my mother and me. Um, you can see the quality has really went down in portraiture then. <laughs> but um, I, I, I want she she fits in my dress. It fits her perfectly, but she's shedding it to be her own person. But at the same time, we're still there. And I think that we always kind of struggle with wanting to please our family but be ourselves. This one is possession. In several of the images here, I um, played with the idea of that fine line between protecting your child and possessing your child. And, it, it, and it's tricky. Like, where do you draw that line? And that, that was the um, topic of that one. And as we shot these, I realized that it we couldn't control a four-year-old but so much. So it became really sort of collaborative because of that. This is one of those that she wasn't really interested in. And she just said, hand me my sippy cup. Mm -hmm. And she tipped it up and gave me a side eye. And I kept <laughs> shooting. And then that one became a stronger idea than what I had in. in initially had thought of. The same for this one. Um, turns out she really likes pomegranates and just couldn't stop tearing into it. And it was going everywhere and then I turned around and looked at her and I said, okay, wait, then we're going to do this one now. And she was really concerned that it was dripping and I was like, no, no, that's good, that's good. <laughs> um, so her um, Appetite created <laughs> this image. And then I would take ideas from things that were happening. She's shy as I was shy as a child. So this image, Wallflower, was based upon that. And then this one, Reliquary, we have these almost religious acts with our children just to hold on to that time that we know is so fleeting, whether it's keeping teeth or locks of hair. And that's what this, this image is about. And that, it's become a book. I have a few copies here. Um, so it was, it was pretty well received and it was fun. It was fun to create these little sets around the house. It was kind of a relief from finding sitters and going out and finding models to just having everything like right there. And that's an interior shot. So I, I get asked a lot how certain images are created. So I have a, a few, you know, random ones to show you some behind the scenes. Um, I like to make them 
as real as possible, even though some of the older work I had to do a few layers. Um, particularly this image, um, this required four assistants, which I don't normally have anybody really helping me. First, we had your wind maker <laughs> for the scar. And then, your ball thrower is ready to go. <laughs> throw in the balls. So when it all came together, even though the balls were not all there at the same time with each other, they all were in those spots so that it looks correct and it, it kind of fools the eye. And it, it sort of looks like performance art when you're out there doing it. For this one, I, I was inspired by my cross the street neighbor had these beautiful, huge rhododendron, but they really weren't terribly big. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this image took the longest in post because I had to zoom in and make sure every single piece was seamless to create that giant wall. And for this series, even though it's it can be dark and it can be, you know, very serious. It's really not. <laughs> this is the Power Ranger that we had to take the photo shoot for first. <laughs> and he was also good for focus. And then we always have to go through a lot of this first. <laughs> Before we can get to something like this. So during this series, Seen Not Heard, I, I really did kind of examine, you know, family relationships. And that's where I decided to keep going with the newest work, which is called Alterations. And it's still in, in, in progress. Um, when I um, was a kid, like, the person I felt closest to was my granny. And she worked at an alterations department in a department store in the mall. And my mom would drop me off while she went shopping, and I would find that this whole room with these four women doing the alterations was my playground. And I would get lost in the big vat of extra buttons, sticking my hands in there, and also just feel kind of this relaxation with just the sound of the machines. And she died when I was 12, so when I look back, I, I don't really know what she was like as a person. I think as a kid you just know how someone treats you when you're that young. And so this series is about how we mend and alter memories and it's also kind of taking those memories I have and putting them in a surreal environment. So I have a few of those to show you. My, my daughter is not like the center of this series but she does appear in some kind of representing me. And more, a lot of these, for this series, I've moved more into almost like still lives. I think my favorite photo of my, my granny and I is, I'm sitting on the kitchen counter and my hair is in pink um, rollers. And so when I think of her, I think of me in those rollers. And just, that's how this came to me. Women um, back then didn't want the alligator on their clothes. Like, I guess they weren't really into labels. So she would take them off and she'd save them and she'd sell them on my Kmart shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so I have brand name clothes. <laughs> and I just loved hiding in the dressing room. <laughs> and we shared a birthday. So that's, that's kind of a, a preview of what I'm working on now, and I'm going to be in a, I haven't exhibited other than maybe a one in a group show here and there, but I'm going to be in a group show next month, um, 
and doing something really different with the work instead of just having it in regular frames I'm making pieces that are more interactive and they have sewing um, bobbles and things with them so that's a whole kind of thing that I'm working on right now and it's kind of scary but it's kind of cool um, I'm also um, part of the Click Photography Festival team and that's going on in October in the Raleigh-Durham Chapel Hill area of North Carolina so if you want to take a road trip there are some brochures back there um, Keith Carter and Mona Kuhn and David Mizell are our keynote speakers so it's, it's going to be really awesome and you can find me here and all my contact information through there. So that's just sort of a, that's my thing. So. <laughs>